Hello, my art history students. Welcome to the first recorded video lecture um, about neoclassicism. Um, I am going to be posting videos uh, by subject um, based on our um, organization of the syllabus, the semester by, by week and by subject matter. And I'm going to be creating these videos to highlight some of the works of art that I really want you guys to pay attention to things that I would be discussing in class and we would be having kind of group discussions about them. So bear with me as I begin this this new process of trying to teach in this asynchronous manner um, and yet try to communicate with you through all the tools that we have through our discussions and through Canvas. So today we're going to be talking about neoclassicism um and very specifically the artist that we use to really begin our discussion of neoclassicism is david jacques louis david what's interesting about neoclassicism is that it is really art that is all about an idea okay that there's this very abstract concept of morality and what art can do and this is really one of the subjects of neoclassicism. Neo, meaning new, and classicism is typically what we refer to when we use classicism in art history as the period of the ancient Greeks and Romans. And neoclassicism becomes a term that is really used to describe a movement that begins in the 1750s as a revival of, an, of antique and Renaissance forms and ideals. And it pervades European and then American art as well as architecture. And so that's really important. This whole neoclassical movement really grows out of and as a reaction against the Rococo, which you guys learned about last class and here is kind of, or, or you learned about it on your own. Here's that painting, a pilgrimage to Cythera, where everybody, all the sort of the, the French aristocracy are out uh, taking a, a joy ride out to an island of love where they're going to participate in all sorts of immoral things and all the little cupids and, and Puti are lighting their way. And you guys read about and learned about this painting. Well, in stark contrast to that, of course, is the painting here. Um, by Jacques-Louis David, the Oath of the Horatii, or Horatii, and that's what we're going to really begin talking about in a minute. So in opposition to the frivolous sensuality of Rococo painters like, like uh, Watteau, right, and here's our friend Mr. Watteau, the pilgrimage to Cythera, um, neoclassicist artists prefer well-delineated forms. They prefer very clear light and clear drawing that you can see here. They prefer modeling and shading. And you can almost see that these look like they could have been Roman or Greek sculptures. I mean, the he's painting them in a way as if he is literally dressing um, nude forms. And I wanted to show you this uh, kind of... Um, object, the Arapacus, that would have been in Rome, and certainly neoclassical artists would have gone and, and taken a, a tour, which is what, you know, artists did for their training, and they would have looked very carefully at many, many Roman and certainly Greek objects that would have been left, and you could see how they could have gotten information about these architectural details as well. But in terms of the painting, the um, the neoclassical surface had to look perfectly smooth, okay? It had to look perfectly smooth. It had to have no evidence of brush strokes um, that would be discernible to the naked eye. And this is important. I want you guys to remember this because really this is a course called Modern Art and we're gonna be talking about, you know, what are the people like Manet, M-A-N-E-T, what are the crazy things that they're gonna do in opposition to kind of what had always been accepted as the perfect example of beauty um, by people like David, by neoclassical artists. And one of them is 
uh, or a few of them are the things I just mentioned, clear drawing, clear modeling, which means shading, um, and the drawing, you know, being able to really execute something that looks realistic is more important, say, than color. That, you know, color is important, but it comes afterwards. Um, so what's going on in this painting? France is on the brink of its first revolution in 1789. And the neoclassicists are trying to give the new France a look, right? What, what is it going to look like? What is the new world? What does, what does virtue and heroism and dying for your country? And as I said before, art about an idea. What does it look like? What does this new moral order look like? And the, these modern artists, or the neoclassicists, are going to reject everything about the, the whimsy and fluff of the Rococo. They're interested in archaeology, classicism, Pompeii, Greece, all of the things that are about virtue. And what's really interesting about this painting is it is supposed to sort of um, inspire people, right, to, to overthrow the, the, the evil... Uh, monarchy and to get people to look at the painting and say okay I get it I get it here's three sons who are pledging with their swords with their father to go off to war to go off to battle um, and to you know die in honor of their state right this semi-religious moralizing theme where you're it's important to give up your life for something you believe in uh, referring to the abuses by Louis, you know, the king who had broken the social contract. And so the citizens need to rise up to do something. Um, but what I want you guys to say and ask yourselves is, wow, you know, why is David in the 17, you know, late 1700s on the eve of this, this moment, 1784, why doesn't he show something contemporary? Why doesn't he show something, you know, of his time? Why does he have to hearken back to this ancient battle that was a story that took place in the Roman Empire? And that's where we get our answer, that neoclassicism, that this becomes the look. These become these the ideas that are most important um, to um, artists of this time period. And so neoclassicism is characterized by clear form, sober colors, very shallow space. It's almost like a stage set, right? There's no deep space going on here. Um, and then a subject matter that has all of this kind of story and learning and moral morality that everybody needs to grasp. So it's a huge painting. It is uh, dated 1784. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can give you the exact dimensions of it. It is, yeah, it's about three, 3.3 meters by four and a quarter meters and every meter is three feet. So it's about 10 by 12. It is at the Louvre right now where you can, uh, you know, it's in this big hallway at the Louvre. So it's huge. And it's the story of the Roman Republic, of these sons who are pledging to die for their republic. For their republic. Um, and you can see them, they're, they're, they're holding up their hands that are the focal point. I think that the hand of the father is the focal point that is inside these, these three arches. And by the way, this is a really interesting, you guys may remember the painting that Leonardo da Vinci did of The Last Supper where Jesus is in the center and he has the 12 apostles on either side of him. And it's the moment where he says, one of you will betray me. But um, Leonardo da Vinci is also using kind of the three shaped windows behind to focus on the focal point. And I think that David is definitely making some sort of a, a reference back to that, the three windows like in Leonardo's Last Supper. Um, there are, you know, these cues of linear perspective that he's using with the, the paving pattern on the floor. Um, but unlike, you know, sort of this endless vanishing point in the distance, it's a very flat space, which is one of the characteristics of modern art that we're going to talk about. Closing off the background forces the viewer's eye to the foreground into the action, right? And then onto the canvas itself. And notice these two 
opposing sides of the canvas, the three suns all lined up, extremely heroic, unfazed, and then this kind of puddle over here of emotion, of course, the women who are all emoting and very sad and worried about their husband, their brothers, um, their sons who are going to go off to this battle. So no longer does the artist, or David in this case, want to sort of trick the viewer that there's this deep space. Um, the flatness instead of the picture plane of the canvas is being asserted, and this is something that we're going to be talking about the entire semester. It is one of the characteristics of modern art, right? You think about how the invention of linear perspective by Brunelleschi um, during the Renaissance was this great accomplishment to make something look endlessly deep. And modern artists are going to reject that. And they're going to say, no, I'm not going to show my canvas as being this endlessly deep space because it's a lie, right? A canvas is a two-dimensional surface. So you're going to hear me talking a lot about that. Um, so the ideology of neoclassicism is really associated with democracy. And that is one of the reasons that we here in the United States have adopted neoclassical um, architecture for our government buildings, right? So it's a, it's a really interesting question. If you think about it and you look at these buildings, the, the White House, the U.S. Supreme Court, um, what does this look like? You know, if you just saw a sort of a, an image of this, this piece of the Supreme Court here, it looks like the Parthenon. Why do our government buildings, um, whether they be in Boston or whether they be, you know, in, in New York City, this is, by the way, um, what Penn Station used to look like. And when they tore it down, this is what they built. And that's like a whole other subject where um, they, uh, they invented the Landmark Preservation Commission after this disaster happened. But why is it that here in the United States, we have adopted um, classical style or neoclassical style for our government buildings? And it is because of all of the, the morality and the virtue and the certainly the, this ideology of neoclassicism that is associated with, um, with democracy and truth and virtue. So it's an interesting question, and I just uh, I want you guys to kind of remember that and think about that in a really interesting way. So David is kind of the first neoclassical painter that we look look at, and here um, here's a portrait that he did of himself. It's uh it's not the best resolution, but he apparently um, had had uh, an accident when he was young. He was cut in the face in a duel by a sword fight, and it affected his speech. And so he really couldn't talk, and it was a it was a problem in that era to not be able to talk and be you know go to parties and kind of you know show everyone how smart you were and engage. And so he retreated into himself, and instead became this incredible painter, this incredible artist. Um, let's look at this work of art, the Death of Marat by Jacques-Louis David, because this is also a really um, interesting and important uh, political painting that he makes, and I just want to talk about it a little bit. So um, by 1793, so the other painting, The Oath of the Horatii, was painted in 1784, okay? So like nine years later, the revolution is happening, and there's violence, incredible violence in the revolution, um, and it dramatically increases until there is, in fact, beheadings that take place in the Place de la Concorde in Paris. And, and Dr. Joseph Guillotine, you know, the guy who has this thing invented, uh, named after him, the guillotine, he invents a machine that improves the efficiency of the axe and block, and ex executions happen really quickly. Uh, and supposedly in a more humane way. So David is in the middle of this. And he makes this painting um, about his friend Marat, who was murdered um, in his bathtub because he has terrible eczema. So he would always be sitting in his bathtub and he would be um, writing and he was, a, he was a revolutionary and he was a, uh, he had a, he was a printer and um, he was a publisher. And so 
as in some of the other works of art we've looked at and we will look at, he substitutes um, religious art, Christian art, for more contemporary issues. And here he is likening Marat, his friend, to Christ. And he's showing him holding kind of the, the letter that was written to him. There's the bloodied knife that's on the floor. Um, and there even is this idea that he's got some stigmata on him. So he's attempting to find new martyrs, right? Revolutionary martyrs to replace some of the saints um, that uh, people can relate to in a very, very contemporary way. So there is this question about, you know, the reign of terror and, you know, this idea that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, but the likening to Christ where Marat is leaning back in his tub, the light that is on him, the sort of very beatific expression on his face, um, even the fact that the, the background is completely darkened like that, um, makes this painting extremely, extremely modern. And it was considered, you know, a masterpiece, um, but also, um, it was very, very controversial because um, he was a revolutionary. Um, and, you know, this woman, Charlotte Corday, had come and, and stabbed him in the heart. And so um, what's interesting is, you know, you think about how there are no newspapers, there's no Instagram, there's none of this, you know, social media that we have now to look at. So what what does a painting like this become? It becomes a symbol, right? Just like this painting becomes a symbol of the revolution. This is another painting by David called The Death of Socrates, the great um, philosopher who wants to drink the poison and die for a greater cause. And I think that it is another painting that is very important and sort of typical for this style, neoclassicism, and really fits in to all of the, um, the qualities that we're talking about neoclassical painting having and why David is such an important neoclassical painter. Um, look at, again, you know, people who understand religion and the Christian metaphor are going to understand the subtle parallels that he's making here. So if you count the people in the painting, there's actually three here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. People will know that this is definitely a reference to the 12 apostles, to the 12 disciples, right? Um, there's also this very dramatic lighting, the gestural form where he's holding up his finger like that. This is absolutely um, something that when you would have studied um, classical art, you would remember, you would absolutely remember this of people who, um, you know, great Roman emperors would be standing. It is, it's the orator pose, sort of making a speech and, and everyone should kind of listen to you. So this is another really important painting um, that uh, would have represented, you know, uh, the true neoclassical style. I also want to talk to you about about another painting that I am looking for. Oh, let's talk about this one for a second. This is a really, really beautiful uh, work of art um, that it was made by David and it's called The Tennis Court Oath. And this is something that really, really happened. There was a gathering in 1791 and it was the catalyst to the revolution um, where everyone got together and they basically took an oath and they said, yes, okay, we, we want to overthrow the unjust government, the king. We want liberty. And in fact, what's really incredible about this, this painting, this is an engraving, I believe, is when you look up here, the top, I'd say, at least half of the painting or the work of art is completely empty, right? There's, there's nothing here. But what David is trying to sort of convey, I think, is that liberty is an idea and the entire space here is in fact filled with that beautiful idea and so the idea is so big and so powerful 
that it actually dwarfs the individual. And yet they're all raising their hand, right? Everyone is raising their hand up to this big idea of wanting to come together to create freedom and to bring, you know, virtue to this, the new world, the new modern world that they're trying to create. So I think that this is a really important kind of concept also that is neoclassical. Neoclassicism is uh, kind of met in our country in uh, sort of a, a couple of different ways. We saw that neoclassicism was clearly uh, accepted and, and still is for our government buildings. But um, this sculpture of our first president, George Washington, was not accepted so well. Americans didn't really love this when it was um, created. Uh, it, it is absolutely, you can see he's in that gestural pose that we just saw from um, the death of Socrates painting. Um, but clearly, this is supposed to be an equation between George Washington and Zeus, the great god, the great king. And this is not how we like to see our leaders, nor did George Washington really like this painting of himself. In fact, um, this is a, a much more apt representation of our leader of George Washington and this is the one that you will find today um, you know in Washington DC um, to represent to represent him okay Monticello Thomas Jefferson also built this incredible um, sort of neoclassical campus in Virginia and these are the the the, the classical buildings, right, where they're coming from. This is the Pantheon and the dome. And you think about how many buildings today have domes on them, right, uh, including, and this is all at, at Monticello, and including, of course, our, um, our buildings right here in Boston, right, that I think I, I showed you, the, um, you know, the State House, right? And there's, think about that great dome building at MIT. So neoclassicism is an important idea. It is uh, kind of this, this virtue-laden, virtue moral-laden uh, kind of art that is very, very important and that um, is going to lay the foundation of kind of the, the discussion of modern art that we um, really begin our course with. Um, and although the 18th century um, will encompass other artistic styles, of course, some of which we will discuss and some of which we won't. Neoclassical ideas can be best seen in painting and portraiture and landscape um, and, of course, architecture. And it is associated with this concept of virtue and morality. That's really what I want you to get. And Jacques-Louis David, the artist, um, who we're really kind of focusing on, he takes this kind of the neoclassical ideas and pushes them even further into concepts of duty and honor and patriotism. And so these classical examples become models and guides, and um, they're a fantastic foundation for us to really begin the course with. So in conjunction with this uh, video that I made you with the, the PowerPoint that I kind of took you through, um, you guys should all go to the assignment for this week. So let me just see. And I am going to, I'm going to upload the video and I'm going to highlight it here so you can click on it. Um, you should also look at this fun facts about French history. So this is this is something that I would have handed out to you if we were in the classroom together. Um, and instead, oops, it's massive. Let's see if I can make it smaller. Yeah. Um, let's see, here we are. Right. So this is sort of some some names and dates from French history, and I just wanted you to see these are some of the artists we're going to talk about next class. Uh, Daumier, Millet, Courbet, and then you can see a little bit of a timeline of what's going on here. Louis XVI was the famous Sun King who was executed. And by the way, there's several Napoleons. There's different Napoleons. You're going to see that there's the 
Napoleon Bonaparte, there's uh, a, a later Napoleon. So it, I know some of my students are often confused by that. Um, and then there's also, of course, different, different Louis who come along. Um, but what's important and what you can see that I'm, I'm writing here is that this is art that's designed to make, you know, make the citizens who see it virtuous citizens, right? And here is in 1793 when the Death of Marat painting happens when she, Charlotte Corday, kills him. So it's a kind of an important and interesting little, little fun fact about the, the French Revolution that I uploaded for you. And... Um, all of these, the Age of Enlightenment, Angelica Kaufman, who's a woman artist that I really want you guys to um, look at and think about, uh, is um, she's a wonderful uh, female artist. So I want you to look at that uh, painting of Cornelia pointing to her children. And I'm going to go over some of this a little bit more next week as well. So if we go to the assignments for this week, which are, here it is. Um, I want you to answer these questions, right? Did neoclassical artists embrace sensuality? You know, what did they value more? What's the connection between the Enlightenment and neoclassical art? And then these, these articles, and um, there may even be a video that I uploaded. So have, have a look at these things and I think that that is going to be a really excellent discussion for us to have. And then, do this, we are actually going to have um, next week, because we're in a political time period right now, I want you to, and you can start thinking about this now, Think about the story that David is telling in the painting we looked at, the Oath of the Horatii, right? And how are visual images used in politics and marketing? And so we're going to have a, a virtual discussion with you guys uploading an image and writing a few sentences about a political or a propagandistic image um, that you um, feel is, you know, relevant today in what's going on. Right. So this is the work for this week. Um, I'm going to upload the video and um, I look forward to being in touch with you all and continuing our discussion about neoclassical art, why we really start our course here, um, and all the different meanings of what modern and modern art means.